Okay, so much for an introduction. What we are talking about when we talk about EEG, because that's why I ask you whether you guys know about EEG and how we analyze uh, the stuff we are measuring. And also keep in mind, that was very nicely shown in the last talk, all these methods have tremendous limitations. And you have to think about that. Don't over-exaggerate your data. You have that one little data point and you try to make, or many people try to make, and you have the tendency, me, even me, and I have the tendency to make a big story out of it. That's how the world operates. But no, usually with one data point you cannot tell how the world operates. So basically what we measure is the extracellular field that is basically generated in the neocortex by the cell type that we have mostly in the extra or in the, in the neocortex. These are these pyramidal cells. And you have to live with my term in accent, sorry. <laughs> now, if you have an excitatory input here to the dendrites, then what you basically get is that sodium ions stream into the cell and that creates a negativity in the extracellular field compared to the still remaining positivity close here to the body. And that creates basically a field that is operating from plus to minus. And when you have many, many cells together that work and are excited in that way, then you create something like a dipole, which is like a tiny little battery that has its po a positive polarity. Now here, in that case, towards the center of the brain and the negative polar to the surface. And when you have then an electrode attached to the top of the scalp, then you will measure a negative potential relatively to a silent point. And in a silent point, what is so-called the reference electrode would be, for example, the tip of the nose or your earlobes. You can put any uh, uh, location that has not an electrical field that is stemming from the brain. And as you know, jury is working and you have that nice MEG device. The MEG, as the contrary, is measuring the intracellular field and the magnetic field that is resulting from that intracellular field. And that's why many people claim that if you have like EEG and MEG together, that gives you complementary information. And the big, big advantage of MEG is that the magnetic field is not distorted by the rest of the brain, which is like your liquid, your bone, the skin, and so on and so forth. So basically what we do then, we put many electrodes on your scalp. And these electrode systems, they follow a very old nomenclature. And this nomenclature was developed while we had very, very few channels to measure, and that was just a limitation of the computer power. And this nomenclature is still valid, and when you read articles about EEG, you will read these magic words that I will explain now to you, and regardless how many electrodes are recorded, you will always find then in analysis section that one is analyzing a particular electrode, and this is always referring to that system. So basically what you do, you measure the distance between the nose and this tiny little bone here in the back of your head, the inion, and you measure the center of it. Then you measure the distance between left and right ear, you put the center in it, and this gives you the electrode C central on the central line, that's the tiny little C, C central. And then you go for that distance 20% in the front. You are now at the frontal part and the frontal lobe of the brain. You still stay in the central line. That gives you the name FC. You go 20% in the back. You are on the parietal part of the brain. You are still at the central line. That gives you the name PZ. And this is not indicated here. If you go another 20 percent from that distance into the back, then you are here at the occipital lobe, and that would give you 
the O set on the curve. And the same you do with the left and right. And now the nomenclature is everything that is on the right cortical hemisphere gets even numbers, and all electrodes on the left have odd numbers. So when you read in an article, we analyze the data on P3, you know that this electrode is located on the parietal cortex on the left side, compared to P4, which would be the identical location in terms of parietal, but on the opposite side. And as you know, the visual cortex is mostly located here in the back of the brain, and this is many of the analysis that I will show you then when we have time enough that I can you a little bit about our data. You will always find examples from electrodes here in the back. So now this was really created where this was like the maximum one could imagine to record. 30 electrodes, that was like more is impossible. And as you know, nowadays you can measure many, many more electrodes. It goes back even to 200. 56 electrodes, then the distance between the electrodes becomes so small that it's no more of an information. But then again, one always has to ask the question, when you look at the research over the last, let's say, attention research over the last 30 years, and EEG, how much of more knowledge have we actually gained by increasing the number of electrodes? It's very, it's very, very little. Does allow us to localize the source of the That's what I wanted to say, <laughs> thanks. So the only advantage of having more electrodes is that you get many more data points, and that allows you to better draw cortical maps in terms of the distribution of the electrical field. And, and this is basically the only benefit of it, that you have then more information how this electrical field is distributed uh, across the scalp surface, and from there you can make mathematical uh, interferences from where in the brain the activity comes from. But as you already see, there's always a limitation. You always measure just that part of the brain, that part of the brain. That you can never measure, but there is activity as well. And another limitation is that the electrical fields are too weak that you can ever measure subcortical structures. Some people claim they can measure amygdala activity. I simply don't believe it. MEG is a different story. There are some ways to squeeze it out, but <laughs> still, I'm not so sure. You can tell a little bit if, if people want to know that. But you basically restrict it to neocortical activity. So now have the situation that we do a basic experiment where I just tell you, watch a screen. Whenever there is a square on the screen, press a button. When there is a triangle or a circle, just simply ignore it. So what we do is we know exactly when in time we have the restrictive or respective elements. And what you do, you measure the EEG just continuously. And during the recording, I exactly mark when does that occur, at what point in time. And I know that the triangle is of interest. This is the one you have to attend to because this is that requires the button press. And the other two are not so interesting. So in order to get now the information out of the EEG, I cut out here some epochs surrounding that event. Uh, because I know exactly when that occurs. That's how the program sends the information to the recording device. And in the next step, <coughs> we have now all these single trials this is now an example for an auditory uh, experiment where at time zero there's a tone that occurs. And now we have all these single events where we know some of them that would be like the triangle, that would be like the circle, and so on and so forth. 
in that particular uh, example, you have just like one event, a click sound. And now what we do, we average these trials based on the assumption that there is a systematic signal that occurs as a consequence of the stimulus, be it the click or be it the triangle, the circle or whatsoever. And of course, your brain is never silent. If you have an isoelectric EEG, then you are gone. So all the other neurons that are still firing, that are not devoted to the click or to the triangle, are also active and that's what you measure. And the idea is basically that what we call noise is stochastic or unsystematic, and the underlying signal is tightly linked to the event. And by averaging that, you decrease the noise by many more averages, and you increase the signal that is systematic. And this here is a nice example for this click uh, uh, sound. This would be like the first one single trial. You see nothing systematic. And when you have about 50 averages here, or even better, if you have 100 averages here, then you see some systematic deflections in the positive and negative direction. And this is like the post-stimulus processing EEG here, what is called an evoked potential. And the nomenclature is not very uh, intuitive. No, it's, it's intuitive. It's not, not, not very like, like, like great in terms of that people were thinking of great names for that particular components. The first positive component was called a P1. The first negative component is an N1, and so on and so forth. So what you can do now is you can average these trials, all the trials that are related to the X. You average all trials that are related to the O. You average all trials that are related to the square. And now you hope, and this is what we are doing, that there's a systematic difference in that ERP between the triangle, where you have to press the button and attempt to, compare it to the other ones. And when you look here at a visual evoked potential, then you see here, in this case, more lateral electrodes because we had a left-right side stimulus. And you know, everything that is shown on the left is processed on the right and vice versa. And what you see here is the difference in that, art in, in that electrode, for example, between the attended stimulus, that would be the triangle, and the unattended stimulus, that would be the other ones. And you see already with the bare naked eyes that there's a difference in those amplitudes here. And now you have already a number of things you can test. First of all, at what time point do you find the first significant difference between the attended and unattended. Second, what is the polarity? Third, is the morphology of the attended and the ignored stimulus identical in terms of do we have always the same latencies of the same P1s, let's say, for an attended and an unattended stimulus. And what you can do in order to get the first glance and information of where roughly in the brain that information comes from, you can draw these topographical maps. That was just like your correct command. And these topographical maps are better the more electrodes you have. But in the meantime, one can say if you have 64 electrodes, that gives you enough information to draw nice maps. And basically, you just say, at the time point, let's say for the N1, so at that particular time point here, I take that time point for all electrodes and draw the potential. And there you see here for that left visual field stimulus, you got a nice negative big potential here at the contralateral side, which is the right 
brain. And that distribution already gives you the first hint that the, if, if that, that activation is, is here located in the scalp surface, it's very unlikely that that is, for example, stemming from the primary visual cortex, in addition with the information that that has a latency of about 150 milliseconds, which is also way too late. Is that clear so far? You, you also have to tell me if you know that already. It doesn't make sense if I, if I tell you something and you sit here, oh, what is he telling about? We have heard that now 20 times. Hmm? So, let's come back to a, 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 a seemingly easy thing what we have already heard about. The spotlight of attention, which is a spatial thing at the famous Posner design we have already heard about. And that basically, as you have already heard, operates in a way an arrow tells you there's a very high likelihood that something happens where the arrow is pointing to. And your task is simply to press a button as fast as possible whenever something occurs on the screen. So what you do you will shift your spotlight of attention while maintaining fixation here to that location because then attention is already at the location where something will happen. Something happens here and you press the button much faster compared to when things happen on the opposite side where your attention is not located. Okay, we know that. This is a highly reliable experiment. You can do that basically even, I always say, if it doesn't work even with closed eyes, you do something wrong. Okay, we know that now. But how does the brain manage that? What's going on in the visual cortex on a pure perceptual basis? That you have a faster response to the attended location when something happens compared to when it happens on the opposite side. And as I just said in the, this is going always a little bit too fast, huh? but this is going back, where I just said the first step basically is usually perception. And after the perceptual processes, then you can make the decision, do I have to press the button? If you make that more complicated, press a button when there is a circle and don't press a button when there is a triangle or whatsoever. Then you know you first have to have the perceptual processes before the motor response can form. So we come now to something which would we call a sensory gain mechanism. And this is a very basic principle how the brain can manage to increase the signal for the to-be-attended object or location compared to ignoring or to the ignored object or location. So I always have the, 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 the kind of, of, of example where I say, imagine now I put here 10 radios in front of you and each and every radio is on a different location. But I want you, without any further trick, to follow the story on radio 3. So what are the possibilities you can do when you just have the possibility to increase or decrease the volume? You can have the one radio making a little bit more louder or much louder. You can make the nine others a little bit turn down the volume gives the same result, or you can have a mixture of two, of both, the one a little bit louder, the rest tune a little bit down. So basically what you do, you increase the gain, the distance between the to be attended and to be ignored. And that's basically what we talk about when we talk about sensory gain. Another mechanism would be you switch the radios, all, all five of the radios, to the very same location. That would also give you the situation, without changing the loudness, the changing the gain, so to speak, that you can listen to that location much better, 
And this is what we find as a very potent mechanism of synchronization. But we won't go into that today. We'll do that when you invite me the next time. <laughs> okay, so this is now what I have. By the way, I always have to tell, or I have forgotten to tell you, we always have like a pre-stimulus baseline. And this is like the thing where we think before the stimulus occurs, this is all noise. And we usually subtract the average response out of this pre-stimulus baseline from each and every data point afterwards to get rid of that so-called noise. So when you do a classical Posner design, then you get a very typical visual evoked potential. And this is following the very simple nomenclature the first positivity, the first negativity, P1, N1. The red would be the one you attend to the left, the left side is a stimulus. The blue is the one you attend to the right on the left side is a stimulus. Also very important, you never ever are allowed to change the physical properties of your stimuli. Because then you cannot decide afterwards, is that due to attention, or is that due to the differences in uh, physical properties of the stimuli. So you always have to have the same stimuli, they occur on the left, they occur on the right, they occur nothing, nothing at all or nowhere. The only thing you manipulate is attend to the left side or to the right. right. So, what do you see already here, when you look at that? Amplitude differences. Amplitude differences. Where do they occur? Hey, come on, people! It's your show, not mine. I know it already. <laughs> should, it be, should it say, ignore right under the red line? Because then I would get that there's a difference, but I don't know if... That doesn't matter. The, now, now just keep it simple again. The right is you attend to a side and the stimulus occurs on that side. Blue would be you attend to the different side, but the stimulus occurs on the very same side. So it's unattended from the location. What else do you see? An amplitude difference. What else? From the things I mentioned already. It's slightly delayed. Uh, yeah. So a difference in time. <coughs> Not really. I mean, even if it looks a little bit, but that, that doesn't look as being significant. So that gives you already the information. It's very unlikely that the brain is operating in a way that the attended stimulus is processed faster. Would be a possibility. It's an arrays model. But obviously that's not the case. What else do you see? Well, the overall topography is the same. So, I mean, the, the overall topography is the same. That's what you perhaps even know already. But I can put it on the, on the screen. That gives you what information? So there's no difference in the topography between the attended and unattended stimulus. It's quite likely that it's the same mechanism. It's very likely that you have the same aerials or areas that are involved in the processing of those stimuli. It could also be that the attended stimulus is processed in totally different areas the attention priority cortical areas. That's not the case. What else do you see when you look at the topography and at that particular ERP? So you see, you have already lots of information just by that simple ERP. You see the latency. 
is about 100 milliseconds. That's too late that it can be in primary visual cortex. Usually the signal is in primary visual cortex at about 60 milliseconds. So you can already give a hint towards spatial attention in that particular case is not modulated in primary visual cortex. You can also say there is no difference in the processing speed between the attended and unattended stimulus. You can say that there's a difference in amplitude. This is what we call sensory gain. So the distance between the attended and unattended is present. What is that you cannot say from that result? So you cannot really say something about the subject experience due to that. I mean, you can you can assume that there might be something different in how you ex experience the attendance, or like how you perceive experience is not important here. Well, but that's kind of like part of intention, right? Yeah, sure. But now we are still in like the very early processing steps where I would say, okay, whether I feel good or not, or I experience that as a challenge or not a challenge or whatever, is, it's not so much a consequence. Can you really say it's about say whether one thing is inhibited or the other? Yeah, yes. you have no idea. I told you, you can either increase the signal for the one you are intended, you can suppress the unattended, or you can have a little bit of everything. Why do you call this amplification then? Not necessarily amplification. Yeah, it's sensory gain. Not necessarily the gain. Oh, jury, don't make it more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tuning. <laughs> okay, that's what you cannot say. So what do you need in order to make sure that you can say, is the attended stimulus now amplified? Is the unattended stimulus suppressed, or is it a mixture out of both? You would need a control stimulus. You need a control stimulus, and what is the classical control stimulus for the Posner design? You have arrows pointing to the left and to the right that gives you no information what is actually the particular location something will happen. And when you look then at the P1N1s in relation to the neutral situation, which is here in the middle, the valid would be the point shows to the, the arrow shows to the direction where something occurs. The invalid would be the arrow would point to here, but it happens here. And the neutral would be in that case that you have like an arrow pointing in all four directions. So, you have here the neutral situation. This is your reference point. Now we can start to argue, is neutral a good reference point? But we don't have the point, the time for that. We keep that now for the sake of, of, of showing a basic principle. What's happening? When you look at the P amplitude in relation to neutral. Well, naively, I would say it looks like a suppression of the yeah. valley. Yeah, so you see that the amplitude is significantly smaller compared to neutral. Valid and, in, and, valid and neutral looks the same. So what you can claim is you get a suppression of the locations that are not relevant for the moment. And now you look at the next amplitude, the N1, there you see something different. There you see that there's an amplification of the valid location. So as it's usually the case, it's very, very rarely an either-or mechanism. The brain is not so digitized as some of the computer scientists wish, wish that it would be. So what you have is you have 
on the one hand, a suppression of the to be ignored locations and an amplification of the to be attended location. And if a stimulus is falling in that location, then the brain is prepared and then you react faster. And now the limitation of these ERPs is given that you have like this kind of temporal morphology. You get a little bit the impression first there is something happening in the P1 and then the whole thing is shifted to the next processing step which is the N1. This is most certainly not the case. But that there is a kind of temporal flow in, a, in, in, in such a feed forward process. And this is actually what we are looking for. We look at post-stimulus processing. There must be something like an ongoing processing that increases or includes now more and more complicated kind of operations. And that is, of course, the case that you have just a very easy extraction and rough extraction going to a more complicated. And we all know in the meantime, this is of course not like just a one sweep that goes through. You have all the feedback mechanisms to lower order areas later on and so on and so forth. Okay. We were talking about the attentional spotlight and, and the spotlight, it's a pure spatial mechanism, was in the pure Postman design always a clear and stone carved theorem uh, <laughs> almost, you cannot split the attentional spotlight. The only thing what you can do is you can broaden the attentional spotlight. If there are a bigger field you have to attend to, you can narrow your, your, your attentional spotlight when you have a very particular location to attend to. So the question is, when I ask you to attend to here and here, what does the brain, or what can the brain do? The classical spotlight would say, no way, you have to extend your attentional spotlight to increase these or to include these two locations. That immediately has the consequence that the to be ignored location is in the center of the spotlight and whatever is in the center of the spotlight is equally important for the brain. And the alternative would be, of course, that, whoops, that you can split your spotlight into two separate locations. This is, by the way, not just a theoretical question. This has many implications, for example, to what extent on a dashboard you put your control lights. And, and if a pilot has, like, when he, when he lands the plane, the information of like the wind speed here, the cross wind speed here, and in the middle is toilet is full. And the brain would always say toilet is full, toilet is full, toilet is full. Then you perhaps would not want to sit anymore in a plane. So the question is, can we have that situation that in the middle is the sign for toilet is full because the pilot can split uh, his spotlight? Or do we have to bring that close together in order to have not the middle location when he needs to extend the spotlight. So now you see a limitation of ERPs when you are interested in such a principal question. What would you see as a principal limitation here? Well, actually, it's a different question. I was just curious, are there any other animals that can split their attention on one? There is some monkey evidence. <coughs> I'm just thinking, actually, uh, several birds have two phobia. Yeah. Right? yeah. So I know it's not actually correlated or yeah. mapping onto the attentional yeah. beam, but how would that work in the bird brain? Is that basically like splitting the attentional beam? Ask, ask a bird expert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a chameleon. Yeah. Or a chameleon. So what is the limitation when you think we stay for a moment or for the rest in the human brain? Because we also have not the funny walk of the pinch. What is a big limitation here when you are interested in that question? When you have ERPs that gives you a response to a stimulus that comes on the screen. Well, we need a possibility to distinguish this. Right. 
you need basically a good way to distinguish what is happening here, 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 and here. And you always have to have the four stimuli simultaneously on the screen. Otherwise, you change the physical properties of your stimulus. If you would say, I have sometimes here stimulus, sometimes here, sometimes here, sometimes all of three, and then I look at the ERP, what is the difference? You would significantly change the physical properties and you can say nothing. So you have to have a way in order to discriminate between the four locations. And now a very nice signal comes into play, the so-called steady-state visual evoked potential. The steady-state visual evoked potential is basically a sinusoidal brain signal that has exactly the same frequency as a flickering stimulus. So when you go next Saturday to your favorite dance hall and the DJ switches on the stroboscopic light, you have not just only the jumpy kind of movements. If I would put an electrode, an O set to each and every individual in the room, I would measure a very nice sinusoidal brain response that has exactly the frequency like the stroboscopic light. Okay, what's the fuss of all of that? What does that help? Of course, I know now the frequency I put into the system. Now I can add a second stimulus with a different frequency. And this is super sexy. I know that I have one stimulus flickering at 10 hertz, another flicker, stimulus flickering at 12 hertz, another one at 8 hertz, another one at whatever hertz. And I know exactly the frequency I'm interested in. And now I do basically, in the Fourier transformation, an analysis just on that particular frequency I'm putting into the system. And when we look at the activation of these, what these steady state potentials cause, then you see it's not just one area that it's activated. You see that a number of early visual processing areas are activated just by a simple flickering light. There's no, nothing else to do, passively viewing at a flickering. And that's why we and others believe that this is a very, very nice method also to investigate dynamics of early processing uh, networks. So now you need another information why the steady state is so super sexy. The amplitude increases significantly when you attempt a flickering stimulus compared to when you ignore that flickering stimulus. So what you basically do when you transform that in frequency domain by a simply Fourier transform, here is an example of two stimuli flickering at 12 and roughly 17 hertz, left and right, let's say. And you see here now the difference in amplitude between attended and unattended. And now you have everything in hand. You can now have many, many stimuli simultaneously on the screen. You just have them at a different frequency. You look at the amplitude and that gives you an estimation of the attentional resource distribution and allocation to a particular stimulus. And you get a very objective signal with its sources in primary early visual processing steps. And that's it. You cannot make a story out of it then and this has something to do with reading of minds or so. You just see is that signal in this early processing steps already augmented or not? And when it's augmented, it's very, very likely that this stimulus gets reference in processing. And now you can do all the following steps. Make a decision whether I have to respond to it or respond to it or whatsoever. Is there any difference in salience between these different frequencies? I mean, could the frequency itself be... The question is, uh, that's what many people ask. Do, do we drive particular networks? in terms of a 10 hertz would be always like a good candidate for an alpha 
let's work. Uh, so far there are pros and cons. Some people say yes, we can really drive something like an alpha network by having a 10 hertz stimulus. We see also a little bit a different um, uh, map of, of cortical generators as a function of the frequency. I truly believe that this is not the case, that we can uh, drive an internally generated network in a certain frequency, such as alpha, by an external pacemaker that is produced by a stimulus. Because the brain always has the task to process that light on, off, on, off. A different story would be if I simulate by, uh, with 10 hertz electrically without any stimulus, then that's a different story. But I don't believe in that you can drive, let's say, an alpha network by a 10 hertz flickering light. And we have very little knowledge what is actually generating these steady states. These are all the limitations. As you have seen, we got smaller amplitudes the higher the frequency is. And luminance has always to be constant. And it's a general finding. The higher the frequency, like constant luminance, the smaller the amplitude. That gives you already, of course, a hint that there must be a tiny little difference between a 10 hertz and a 16 hertz processing network. So the, the consequence would be if you want to have high frequency, uh, high stimulation frequency, big signals, you have just to have very bright, like the stroboscopic light, for example. Mm -hmm. So the last, the last uh, question so far is not answered even about the generator. Some people claim it's just a superimposition of transiently evoked potential. So in the, in, the, in the easiest case, as you have seen, the P1N1, you got a superimposition of all these N1s, because each individual light on produces a P1N1 at a certain location. And that's why, and that's also general finding, around 10 hertz, you got the greatest amplitudes. <coughs> they are pros and cons. But that, that would mean that you would like your different frequencies to be quite close together, to yeah. have, but then you get leakages. Yeah, that's why you have always make the, the tough decision. On the one hand, you have to make them <laughs> similar enough that you don't change the physical properties in terms of like the difference in frequency. And secondly, you have to have them separated enough that you can analyze them in frequency domain where you have always the problem temporal versus um, uh, um, uh, spectral resolution. Mm -hmm. And so what are the... Usually it all depends what we are doing. When we are interested in time courses, then we go at least at a three hertz difference when you analyze for an ongoing long period, like two, three, four, yeah. five seconds, okay. two hertz is enough. Yeah. Okay. And how short, because you need a certain period yeah. to measure. So first of all, you need to the entrainment of that thing. That lasts about five, 600 milliseconds. Again, a number of circles, because you got a big onset ERP, and then it starts to entrain. And usually we have uh, trials that last in the four to six seconds range. And you average over the whole period? And you average over the whole six seconds then. Yeah? And then you do an FFT. Usually you throw away the first five, six hundred milliseconds because you have the big onset ERP. But then you have the long entrainment. And then you average for each particular condition. And then you transform it in frequency domain. It's the same logic as an ERP analysis. Any other question? When did we start? At 2? Uh, at 1? Okay. So then I have basically already to stop no, before to good. show you we all. Have some. So now we use that trick in terms of different frequencies for our question of splitting the attentional spotlight. We had four different frequencies here. Subjects arrive and they were constantly flickering, no change whatsoever in the physical properties. Subjects either had to attend to the tool here on the left side, that's the easy part, the boring part if you wish. But then the more interesting part is you attend to here and here, 
And the task was always press a button whenever this kind of aid is occurring on both locations simultaneously. Now the classical spotlight model would predict if you have that situation, you would have exactly the same amplitude for that location here because it's in the middle of your attentional spotlight compared, for example, to the situation where you have it here or where you need to split it here, it doesn't matter. So it can never be unattended. These are just the different conditions and the frequencies we are using. Here again you see the nice signals we receive for the respective frequencies, always contralateral to the respective visual field. And when we look at the distribution of the amplitudes, these are the boring cases, but that just shows that things work. That is, you attend to these two locations in comparison you ignore the two locations here, this is attending to here, and you see vice versa, the big differences in the steady state amplitude. And now the interesting part is what's happening when you split the spotlight. Again, here you have to compare similar conditions where you have to split the spotlight, not where you have to have the two locations left or right together. So the interesting part is what's happening at that location here when you split your attention in a way that this has to be ignored compared to when you split your attention that this location is part of the attended location. And again you see a big, big difference in amplitude. And that's a nice way to show how you can use these steady state visually evoked potentials to go in very basic questions of attentional resource distribution. You know very little about it. And on Wednesday I will tell you how we use that technique to look into the competitive interactions between emotional stimuli and stimuli that are unemotional but form the task you are, have to do. So to what extent can we measure with that technique that emotional stimuli really serve as a potent distractor? And the other super, super sexy thing about steady state, I don't go into all of the uh, rest of the result, is we can measure temporal dynamics much better than with any other case or dependent variable. You have this ongoing sinusoidal signal. We know that the amplitude changes as a function of shifting attention. And here's a nice example of a shifting experiment. We had left and right flickering stimuli. And they started to flicker. That's the baseline. And now the cue tells the subject from now on the left stimulus is the important one. And now you nicely see how this steady state amplitude develops as a function of time after the cue. And you basically now just calculate the envelope curve of that steady state amplitude and now you do all the nice statistics to test at what point in time you got a significant increase in amplitude, let's say, compared to baseline. And that gives you then a temporal indicator of how long it lasts, how long the brain needs to shift attention from the moment the cue points to the left until the resources are really bound to the left stimulus. Is there a phase shift there or is that just... Does it phase is a very interesting thing. We ignore phase so <laughs> far uh, because phase is of course a very informative inf <laughs> signal. Uh, at the moment, we always have the problem with the circular thing of the face. And the other problem is you have to have a very, very high signal, a good signal, in order to analyze face. And the other thing is, in order to really properly analyze face, you have to do it on a single trial, not after averaging. And that causes all the problems. But this is right. It could easily be that with attention, you got a face change in terms of 
something is going a little bit differently as a function of time. Yeah? But that's what we ignore very much at the moment, because we have no good ways to look at things. I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but it looks like it's going down just before the stimulus. Mm -hmm. This is a consequence of a uh, visual evoked potential that is evoked by the onset of the cue. And this is what we need to filter out. And that damp dampens a little bit the, the uh, amplitude here at that time. But that's why we would never do a statistic against here, so to speak. We take an average out of here where nothing happens. And then we start like a point to point analysis at what point in time we got a significant increase of that amplitude as a function of time compared to this. Sorry, but is that uh, only the left hemisphere? Is this the that would be one side. That would be one right yeah. Have you singled out a specific frequency? Or is this, is a, this is now just the frequency. Uh, this is just the experiment. The, okay. the left bar was flickering at 20 hertz, the right bar at 27 hertz. We know exactly the frequency. We had he LEDs here, that's why we were able to use higher frequencies. Subjects then were cued, as you saw in the signal, to attend to left and right, and were asked to detect targets that are color changes here at the to be attended bar. So the signal we just saw was the superposition of those. Or the that was just like uh, that, was no that was just like one mm. single subject, one electrode, right. averaged across shift attention two. Mm -hmm. But this is very important. We are interesting in the question, please remember, how are the neurons doing that trick? So what's happening with the attended and the unattended? And we are still in the sensory gain idea. And what you see here now is this is the time course for the to be attended stimulus. And you see the increase in steady state amplitude, as I just showed you. And this is the time course of if you attend to 20 hertz, but the Q, uh, no, this is the time course of the 20 hertz flickering bar, but the Q tells you shift now to right. And there you see the amplitude is basically on baseline level. So here for this more longer duration sustained attention situation, where you get an increase, uh, where you, you have to attend for several seconds to one location, we see no suppression of the to be ignored compared to the baseline. We only see an amplification. And now you see again, there is a tremendous difference between things that are going in the brain while you have to constantly attend to something compared to it's just a short moment in time. The mechanisms might be different. So the post-stimulus processing from ERPs, that just gives you just the information what's happening when something flashes up for 50 or 100 milliseconds. But if you, if you try to mimic the more constant occurrence and, and, and the more constant being of objects in our environment, visual environment, by flickering, then you see that the mechanisms are not identical. So you do not get the suppression of the 2P ignore, what the P1 would have told you. Mm. So different mechanisms. And we will not come to feature base, I'm afraid. Uh, but what I want to show you is who knows that nice model about feature-based attention on the feature similarity gain model. Okay. As I told you, you said something where I can talk three days without a break. So far we have only talked about location as the prime criterion to select and this is so handy and so nice because when you look at the ana uh, anatomy, we have a clear mapping of locations on our retina that goes one-to-one -one into primary visual cortex and some higher 
cortex, cortices, that is what we call retinotope organization. So it looks even from the anatomy that location is like the most important thing to select stimuli. And as you perhaps know, in the mid 80s, that was questioned by the finding, no, you don't have to select by location with a spotlight model that always says whatever is in the spotlight is important. Because if you present your subjects stimuli like this one, and I ask you, is this a female face or a male face? You can easily do the task. If I ask you, is that like a more office building or would that be more like a private house building? Then you can give me an answer if you think of a stereotype of an office building when you look out of the window. But in order to do the task, your attention the spotlight has to be here. And you have the house and the face in the center of your spotlight. This is the object-based account, so that, that attention also operates by selectively extracting whole objects. And the very last criterion, so to speak, that was put into the game was the feature similarity gain model. And this is basically the idea, you have a third possibility to extract information, and this is based on features. And this is one of the models that was developed from animal research. The other one is the bias company. Oh, you have to invite me many more times than we <laughs> go oh, through all that. Uh, the other one is the bias competition model. But this is a basic example of how that worked, and that's also the experiment Stefan Troje did together with uh, uh, Martinez. You find a neuron in area MT. This is this area that likes motion, that is highly sensitive or likes to process a motion flow that goes from up to down. You present the neuron in its receptive field, such a motion, you hear it firing. If you bring the counter direction, that is this direction, it's basically silent. So you have these highly specific neurons that are tuned to a certain motion direction. <coughs> this is what you record from. Now the monkey has the task to fixate here, as usually, and to attempt to that particular location, opposite. And now you have either dots that are going into the direction of the stimulus that neuron likes, or it goes in the anti-direction. The spatial account would say, we would find absolutely no difference in the measurements here because that's out of the attentional spotlight. That's in the dark. But what you actually find, you see here. When at the to be attended side, the flow of dots is in that direction that neuron likes, you got a much higher firing rate compared to when it's in the null direction. So there is a basic principle that's called feature-based attention that neurons that are linked to the processing of a certain stimulus are activated and that's even when the stimulus is outside of the primary locus of attention. That is what's called the global effect of feature-based attention. And we have already heard about visual search. And the feature-based mechanism is now the prime mechanism that is discussed. And this is a nice mechanism how to explain how feature-based attention might work. In particular, when you think of the wolf model, what Joshua has shown in one of his last slides as an opposite or is it an opposite as a further development of the treesman? But they have fundamental differences. 
And the fundamental difference would be that Wolf would say we have these feature maps that operate in parallel and when you attend to a certain feature, because you have prior knowledge, you never have a search display that I show you and I say, search. In the examples from Joshua, you had like, was it the S, <laughs> the green S or so, yeah? So you know it's green and it's S-y. So already the feature maps that are responsible for green are increased in terms of activation and the feature maps that code something like essiness or orientation are already activated. And the idea is that they are additively linked together. <coughs> and in a classical search design, In my case, it would be like the red X. You have now everything. See what is going on here? Yeah. Again? It's the red O, yeah, sorry. So, um, everything that is O ish is highlighted, and everything that is red is also highlighted and there's only one location where you have red and O and that pops so to speak out of that feature map and this is my attention is shifted much earlier to that location compared to what Treisman would have said and there was this question this morning how can we explain that under some circumstances people are much much faster uh, to find the search target compared to what Treisman would say, this is the answer to it. You see that there are some locations that neither have O nor have red. This can be already eliminated from your search display because it cannot be that there is a red O in these locations. So either you do then like only a serial search to those locations where you have like one, or you get almost like a pop-out effect to that particular location where you have this additive effect. And that would be now the story how we did with steady states, some basic research on looking into these principles of feature-based attention. And I just want to show you two experiments. The one is the very basic experiment, how we started it, that's almost historical already where we presented the two flickering dots with blue and with red. Both are flickering at different frequencies. The cross in the center told the subject, now blue is important. They were not just flickering, they had also some random motion. Sorry, all the dots were flickering. All the flickering, they were all flickering. And they also had like some random motion. Mm -hmm. And from time to time, either the blue or the red dots, you had a subset of dots that did coherent motion events. Subjects were instructed, press a button, whenever you got a coherent motion for the to be attended color and ignore the coherent motion for the to be ignored color. Was this deep in central fixation while they were doing that? That was central fixation. Yeah. Was that as far as we can control for that with like our eye movement. E. So all of these tasks that we talked about in this talk are all... It's all, all... I mean, the, the, the reason why we do that is that no, we have big artifacts whenever yeah, yeah, you move yeah. your eyes and you blink and everything. You know, that's why we always have, like, you fixate the center. So when you have such a stimulus display, you have two opposing opinions what will happen. Treisman, and this is a quote of a study, it's just by accident that we choose or to have chosen red and blue, I found that quote later, would say, attention cannot be distributed over a subset of items, e.g. the red ones, when these are spatially scattered among other items in a randomly mixed display. Because the attentional spotlight has to cover the whole area 
in order to detect these coherent motion events. It was always just a subset of, and they were also moving randomly. So you had no chance to do the task by concentrating when you attend to red to that corner. Because in the next frame, there, there was no blue uh, dot anymore here. And of course, the feature similarity gain model would say that's not a problem at all, because feature-based attention modulates the gain, the gain of the cortical neurons tuned to the attended feature. That is, you have again a, feature, a sensory gain process, that is, you get an increase or at least a distance between the attended and the unattended. And when we look at our steady state amplitudes, here you get like the signals as we measure it, Look at OZ, uh, the occipital electrode at the center line. You attend to red. Look at the seven hertz stimulus. You have a nice choosing amplitude. Now you ignore red, which is automatically you attend to blue. And you look at the seven hertz amplitude. You see the big difference. And the same is true, vice versa. You attend to blue, big amplitude. You ignore blue, which is um, automatically you attend to red. You get the difference. And that was questioned many, 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 many times. Is there not even a slight possibility to do that task on a spatial base? We had many, many fights. Short Sperling was the gladiator in the field who is still defending the spatial account. There's nothing else possible than spatial. There is no feature-based selection in the human brain. Full stop. Two articles he wrote with the wrong design. <laughs> At the end, he was losing the game, and I did that work together with Stephen Hilliard, and we were always making our jokes. One day a dead body will washed on the sea's shores of San Diego, and that will be George Sperling, because he has to commit that there is feature selective attention and there is color selection possible in the human brain. And in the meantime, nobody would deny that. When we look at the sources, again, we get this activation of early visual areas, as I already showed you. And now comes a critical point. You can say, haha, they not just attend to blue or red, they attend to 7 hertz or 12 hertz. So that's the frequency matter. That's different. I mean, you can easily see that one is flickering faster than the other one. So it's not blue or red. It's fast or slow. It's also a feature, but it's a different feature. So what we did in order to control for that, we did a behavioral experiment. That's what you can just do then with a behavioral experiment, where you either have the situation where you have the different frequencies or the same frequencies. And if it's the case that subjects were really extracting the information based on the frequency, then they should be much worse in the case where you have both dots flickering in the very same frequency. And when you look at the behavioral data, that's absolutely not the case. <laughs> when you look at D prime, they are even better when it's in the same frequency compared to when it's a different frequency. With the same frequency that they were both. in phase. No, they have to be, was it in phase, out of phase? Or would it make a difference? Um, no. no. But again, we have like this random motion and so on and so on. Was there any difference with the, um, the other stimulator, the central fixation cross and the spatially distributed um, changing dots? with the eccentricity from the fixation? We cannot look at that. We cannot look at it, what is like the special response to the dots closer to the fixation cross compared to the ones that are more in the periphery, uh, given that they all flicker at the very same frequency. But you, you could, if you, if the thing that's important in some trials happens in the end. Yeah, but that's what we know. Do. That was not the question. The question you don't was think there would be a difference, though, given that you think it's people there. Yeah. Could be that in the periphery, that in the periphery that you would say they would 
be worse in the in the behavior because they would miss more of that coherent yeah. motion events due to what we have already learned yeah. about the the, the perception, span. perception span. Could be. That was not the question. That was just in the first experiment showing its principal possible. Sure. In principle possible. So you see, and we did that now many, many times, that we did behavioral controls and look where the frequency is important, but it was never the case. So you can really exclude frequency. So, and the last one is like what I told you for the guided search, and then I will really stop, although there are some other interesting things. We were looking into that idea of an additive effect of different features. That's the basic idea of the Wolf model. That's also what the feature similarity gain model claimed without taking any reference to the Wolf model. They were really developed independently, but with some similar ideas, if you wish. So what we did, we tortured our subject with four different stimuli. And they all flickered at different frequencies. We have the horizontal bars, we have the vertical bars, they were either blue or red, and now they have to attend to the horizontal blue. We don't have to discuss anymore that the spotlight model would say this is impossible. What will happen if the tiny little cartoon I showed you that the brain will elevate everything that has one feature of the feature conjunction, then you must expect, if you attend to horizontal blue, these guys must get some increase in amplitude as well, because they share blue. And these guys should get some increase in amplitude also, because they share the information orientation. The only group that shares nothing are those. Huh? That's the strict kind of prediction you would make out of the wolf model. And you would say you have an additive effect. This one gets the biggest and highest and it's additive. And when you look at the interaction model, we have then averaged across all frequencies by, of course, normalizing the amplitudes and so on and so forth. Interesting is you attend to color, you ignore to color, you attend to orientation, you ignore that particular orientation. The most boring part, of course, is you attend to color and orientation. These are the blue, vertical, Guys, you ignore color and you ignore the orientation. These were the red guys. And now you see what's happening when you attend to blue, but this is a different orientation. Or you attend or you have to unattend, so to speak, the color, but it has the same orientation. And as you easily see from that interaction plot, there is no significant interaction, which is the sign statistically that you have an additive effect. And here you see that you can look into very basic principles of early perceptual processes. They are, of course, top-down modulated. We talk now at the moment only from top-down modulated perceptual processes. And this is when I say keep it simple and then don't make then a story out of it and that has something to do with blue is the color of love and if that would be different when you take yellow or something like that, that, that doesn't help. When you say the interaction isn't significant. Yeah, I know, everybody right. says that. But I'm wondering uh, the, if it's the, the proportion <laughs> of variance <laughs> is 1%. Okay, but I'm wondering is it a big individual difference then? It's a visual working memory capacity or something? No. Not very much. And we did 
another, we did other studies where we then compared space with a feature. We also got the additive effects. We did just recently a study where we really show, even mathematically, that it's really mathematically even an additive effect. Uh, so that's now clear, at least when you have these simple stimuli. That's the restriction. Does that also work when I have to search for more complex images? Uh, and how does it work? Uh, the more features you have, and they are all additive, I mean, that would give a pop-out effect the more features you put into a single object. So that would mean if you have objects that have 10 features, they should be easier to find compared to objects that just conjoin two features. But I guess that's not the case. There will be then at one point in time, there will be a limitation. But first of all, it's nice to show that this mechanism in principle is possible and the neurons work in that at least macroscopically recorded signal. Okay, now I stop. I promised it. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we sit for another two hours. <laughs> okay, any questions, comments? Grill me now. Responded to neurally, individually. So certain visual uh, neurons will uh -huh. respond to certain colours, uh -huh. and some to certain orientations. Uh -huh. And I guess this is what you were saying at the end. But again, just to, to clarify, to, you, although it's additive in the sense where these two very primitive differences can be discovered, as soon as you move away from the primitive, or are you just going to say, "I have no thoughts on that matter"? Does it become more, you know... That's, that's, what, we, that's what I just said at the yeah. end. Uh, we don't know. I mean, this is, this is basically here low-level vision. Yeah. Huh? Uh, and you, I mean, objects are more than just red or horizontal. Um, and that's, of course, always a limitation. And, and the, the question would be, how can you generate smart stimuli where you can then manipulate the different features that you put together, the different feature conjunctions, and to make sure that, are, that they are not spatially separated, A, and B, that they do not form objects. Could you do something with edges? Because edges are, uh, um, uh, you, you can pick out edges in a similar kind yeah. of way. Yeah, or you can, we also were level? thinking about geometric figures. Uh -huh. okay. uh, and uh, that, that might, but uh, somebody has to do it one day. Hey, that's a good position. Is there anyone looking for a PhD position? <laughs> that would be the project. <laughs> we simply don't know. Yep. After all, it's an ex empirical, empirical question. Also, the question how many features you can conjoin that you still got this additive effect. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, we always talk, of course, of an additive effect also of feature dimensions. Now, how many feature dimensions do we actually have? Because movement would be another. Because movement, movement would be another. Of your but is luminance already another? Yeah. I, I mean, all, all these kind of primitives and basics, when you're doing something with modulation, um, some will be affected more than others. I guess movement will ob is an yeah. obvious one. And, and I guess luminescence as well yeah. is... Yeah. And what we, what, we do, what we found out with our conjunction of, of space and features, space is always special. And the effects for space, space are much higher compared to the feature per se. Mm -hmm. Because it was also one of the claims of the feature similarity gain model, space is not special, it's just another feature. It's just another information you have. What, what do you mean by space? Yeah. Uh, location, where, you, where, right. where this object is located. Huh? Um, and and that, that's, that's no better as an information compared to its red or its blue. Uh, but that doesn't look like that. So whenever you put certainty in spatial information, that is, the stimulus on the left side is important. And even though the left side stimuli are so superimposed, then you got that global effect that you attend to blue on the left, you got an increase of blue on the to be ignored right, but it's not just the feature, you got a space plus effect. Mm -hmm. 
So there, there is some truth that, that space is, of course, special, uh, but that's, that's not the question. I mean, it was just like, if you wish, the, 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 the kind of discussion is location, spatial information, the only way how the brain can extract relevant information and ignore irrelevant information. And that's obviously not the case. And it's, 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 it doesn't make any sense to discuss now, is it now all feature? Because it's just basically necessary to show that these mechanisms are possible. And then the brain will choose that particular mechanism that is optimal to solve the task. And if the spatial, the location information is the one that makes the trick and the task easy, then why should I take a more complicated strategy to, to look for the red apple in the tree. And therefore it's not the question of a, is it all that or that. It's, it's possible. No? And the days where you were walking through the deserts and you found out, as I said before lunch, and you found mm -hmm. out that the red stuff is more sweet and tastes better, then you have a feature-based account. Everything that is red should be important. And then you start afterwards to do perhaps a more object-based. Is it the red that looks like the things one should eat? Or is it the red that looks like my uncle didn't come back after he has eaten that red stuff? Mm -hmm. And that's... for your spatial, object, and feature-based attention. Mm -hmm.